The Curse of the Bambino. For 86 years, from 1918 to 2004, the Boston Red Sox never won a title. Most people know the broad strokes of this story, but few realize how close the Red Sox came to breaking the curse while it was happening. Four times the Red Sox entered the World Series between 1918 and 2004. Four times the series went seven games, and four times the Red Sox lost. As the Red Sox racked up titles in the 21st century, it became easy to forget just how wild the curse was in the 20th. To younger fans, the Red Sox are perennial winners, but this wasn't always the case. For almost a century, the Red Sox were cursed, torture, and pain. This is the story of four Red Sox teams that came inches away from reversing the curse and the one team that finally did. This is the four falls of the Boston Red Sox. Do you get it? Because the World Series is in the fall and, and they fell in the fall because they lost the World Series in the fall. I stole this from a 30 for 30. Uniquely situated in the center of Boston, unlike modern ballparks, which are built somewhat outside city centers, Fenway Park is baseball's oldest stadium. Built in 1912, Fenway offers fans an experience that has gone largely unchanged for over 100 years. It features a 20-foot tall green monster in left, a 420-foot center field, and 302 feet right down the right field line to the pesky pole. In Fenway's first year of existence, 1912, the Boston Red Sox won their first World Series. They would then win three more in 1915, 1916, and 1918. One of the stars of those Red Sox team was the often drunk pitcher Babe Ruth. And in 1919, Boston owner Harry Frazee decided to trade him to the New York Yankees for $125,000. Or as this paper put it, more than $100,000. Because back then, if it's more than $100,000, you might as well stop counting. You could buy two houses for a nickel. This was the dawn of the curse. In New York, Ruth won many more titles and became baseball's most popular star, revolutionizing the game with his bat. But in Boston, the lowly Red Sox would be bad for 20 years, until a certain outfielder named Ted Williams came along. The San Diegan came up with the Red Sox in 1939 and became one of the greatest hitters who ever lived. In 1941, Ted Williams hit 406 in a season, the last player to hit over 400 in a season. Teddy Ballgame, as he was called, was one of the greatest hitters who ever lived. In his 18th season, he hit 388, and he posted the best on-base percentage of all time at 482. His stats would have been even greater if he hadn't done two tours of military service during his career, missing five seasons of his prime. His service was not ceremonious either, like other players. Williams flew planes in both World War II and Korea, taking hearing damage in a firefight and once sa safely crash landing in North Korea. Ted Williams had a poor relationship with the Boston media and fans. Once in his rookie season, he was booed, and he never forgave the fans. He refused to ever tip his cap to the crowd. The closest Williams ever came to winning the World Series was in 1946, the Red Sox' first fall classic since Babe Ruth left the team almost 30 years prior. This is fall number one, the Mad Dash. Ted Williams had a difficult time hitting in the only seven postseason games he ever played because of the invention of something called the shift, where St. Louis players would line up on the right side of the infield to stop Williams from getting hits through the second base hole. This was the first iteration of a shift ever. Actually, the shift was commonly used by Eddie Collins of the Philadelphia Athletics in 1923, which, which caused a lot of success. Okay, shut up. Listen, it was the most popular use of the shift. It was when it became popular for the first time. All right, all right, calm down. Although Williams struggled, the shift didn't stop the Red Sox from taking a 3-2 lead going into the sixth game. The Red Sox, up 3-2, lost the sixth game in the series, and then were down 3-1 at the top of the eighth of the seventh in Sportsman's Park in St. Louis. But the Red Sox tied the game at 3-3. Then it was the bottom of the eighth. Cardinals player Enos Slaughter was on first when another Cardinals player got a single, but Slaughter just didn't stop. Not at second and not at third. He ran all the way home, scoring the winning run of the seventh game of the 1946 World Series. And the Red Sox would go home without a title. Slaughter's mad dash from first, as it became known, was only the first of many tragic Red Sox World Series defeats. Williams never made it back. The next year in baseball, 1947, Jackie Robinson debuted in integrated baseball, leading all teams to eventually add African-American players. The Red Sox were actually the last team to do this two years later in 1949. Oh, whoops, 12 years later in 1959. For a decade, Frank Robinson, Ernie Banks, Hank Aaron, Roy Campanella were tearing up the league and the Red Sox were like, nah, we're good. 14 years later in 1960, Ted Williams was retiring. And a cold day at Fenway Park, in his final at-bat ever, 
Tell Williams hit a home run. A famous New Yorker piece captured the moment the best. Like a feather caught in a vortex, Williams ran around the bases at the center of our beseeching screaming. He ran as he always ran on home runs, hurried, unsmiling, head down, as if our praise were a storm of rain to get out of. He didn't tip his cap. Though we thumped, wept, and chanted, we want Ted for minutes. After he hit in the dugout, he did not come back. Our noise for some seconds passed beyond excitement into a kind of immense open anguish, a wailing, a cry to be saved. But immortality is non-transferable. The paper said that the other players and even the umpires on the field begged him to come out and acknowledge us in some way. But he never had and did not now. Gods do not answer letters. Without Williams, the next six years were quiet in Boston. Attendance at Fenway fell, and ownership privately wondered about moving the team. Entering 1967, most fans presumed the Sox would have another pathetic season. This is really a love story. An affair twixt a town and a team. A town that had waited and waited for what seemed an impossible dream. The 1966 Red Sox were 72 and 90, but in 1967, with talented outfielder Carl Yastrzemski and young outfielder Tony Coniglihera, the Red Sox were in the running for the AL pennant. However, in August, Coniglihera was hit by a ball in the face. His eye was damaged. He was out for the season and was never the same again. That left the offense up to. Every time the Red Sox needed a big hit, Yaz provided. That year, he won the Triple Crown, leading the AL in home runs, RBIs, and batting average. In the last week of the 1967 season, four teams in the AL were in the running for the pennant. But on the last day of the year, the Red Sox clinched their first pennant in 33 years. Bedlam broke out in Fenway Park. It had now been 49 years since the Red Sox had won the World Series, and they were just four wins away. But against the St. Louis Cardinals again in the World Series, the Sox found themselves down 3-1. They rallied, winning games 5 and 6, but at Game 7, Bob Gibson pitched 9 clean innings and even hit a home run. The impossible dream was no more. Despite the World Series result, Red Sox fans still remember the summer of 67 very fondly. It was a shimmer of light that created the idea that maybe someday soon, the curse would be lifted. It would only be another 7 years before Red Sox fans were back in the Fall Classic. The 1975 Red Sox featured a whole cast of characters. Louis Tiant, a Cuban whose windup was magical. Bill Spaceman Lee, whose Ephus pitch was memorizing. Rookie MVP Fred Lynn, future Hall of Famer Jim Rice, and... The team made it back to the World Series, where the Red Sox were down 3-2 in the series and 6-3 in the bottom of the eighth. Red Sox outfielder Bernie Carbar was drunk high or both. Probably both. He later admitted that he was the high every house. game he played. Did almost as many drugs as you did. Nobody did as many drugs as I did. In the bottom of the eighth inning, in game six, he's, he was called as the tying run. He got a pinch to hit and hit it far above the Fenway fence, tying the game at 6-6. The fans erupted. One fan who would have been in the ballpark was one Sean McGuire. However, he gave up his ticket because he had to go see about a girl. Apparently, his friends let him get away with that. Later, in the bottom of the 12th in a tie game, Boston catcher Carlton Fisk came up to the plate. He hit a deep fly ball to left field and tried to will the ball to stay fair. It did, hitting the top of the Fenway foul pole and the Red Sox lived to see another day. Surely here the curse would end for a great game six win always leads to a game seven victory. However, in the seventh game, the Reds called the Big Red Machine, not to be confused with the Wiggles Big Red Car, won the series and began their small dynasty. It had now been 57 years since the Red Sox last title. Before we go into the last fall, I wanted to take a moment and give some background on Red Sox fans and also try out my Boston accent. The Red Sox are the northernmost MLB team and their fans stretch all across the New England region. From Maine to Rhode Island to New Hampshire to Connecticut to Vermont and to, of course, Massachusetts. These folks have had to deal with cold winters, lobster prices, and an unjust tea tax for many years. The Sox were a vehicle for their tough mentality. Boston and New England itself is also home to many universities. Harvard, MIT, Boston College. And for students who didn't come in with strong allegiances, many picked up the Sox as their favorite team. This led to the Sox having one of the largest and most loyal fan bases in all of baseball. 
Although the curse had already lasted 57 years, Red Sox fans were not yet out of the woods. Deep to left. Yastrzemski will not get it. It's a home run. All right, it's fall 3.5 because these Red Sox didn't make the World Series. But in 1978, the Red Sox were up eight games on the New York Yankees for the playoffs. But the Yankees came back, tying the Red Sox on the last day of the season. They then played a one-game playoff to see who would advance. In the top of the seventh of this game, the Red Sox were up 2 to nothing when Bucky Dent, a career backup second baseman, hit a three-run home run to give the Yankees the lead. The final batter of this game was Yastrzemski, who hit a long pop-up that ended the Sox season. Yastrzemski retired three years later. Little roller up along first. Behind the man! Perhaps the most famous incident of the curse came in 1986. That year, the Red Sox had a magical season with star players Roger Clemens, Wade Box, and Carl Yastrzemski. Oh wait, no, he retired. Bill Buckner had had a long career in the National League, but the Chicago Cubs thought he was washed, so they traded him to the Red Sox, where Buckner's career had a renaissance. He became a mainstay in the Red Sox order and a huge producer of runs for the team that year. In the 1986 ALCS, the Red Sox magically came back, which I covered in my last video from a 3-1 deficit and a 6-3 deficit in the top of the ninth of Game 5. In the World Series, the Red Sox were in the driver's seat against a 108-win Mets team who liked to get arrested during road trips, destroy a charter plane, and do lots of coke. The Sox were up 3-2 in the series and had just scored two in the top of the tenth. They were now up 5-3. And when Keith Hernandez flew out, they were one out away from giving New England its first title in 68 years. The Shea Stadium scoreboard briefly flashed a message that said congratulations to the Red Sox for winning their first World Series since 1918. All the Sox need here is one out, but Calvin and Schiraldi and later Bob Stanley can't seem to get it. Off Schiraldi, Gary Carter gets a hit. Then Kevin Mitchell, who's in the Mets dugout planning a flight home to the West Coast, comes up and gets a hit. Then Ray Knight comes up and gets a hit. It's now 5-4 and the Mets have two men on. Then John McNamara comes he out. Wants he wants Bob Stanley, Stanley to pitch to Mookie, Mookie Wilson. Wilson. Mookie puts up a great at-bat, fouling balls off over and over again. Finally, a pitch comes inside on Mookie. He jumps away from it, and the runner from third scores, tying the game. The Shea Stadium crowd went crazy. They were on the brink of losing their season, and somehow, with two out, they had just strung together three hits and a wild pitch and tied the game. The Red Sox have already collapsed. Things are already in motion for bad things to happen. Bill Buckner is just the icing on the cake. Little roller up along first. Behind the bag, it gets through Buckner. Here comes Knight and the Mets win it. The trauma for Red Sox fans after this event was unbearable. The Mets won game seven and it would be another 18 years before the Red Sox would make it back. Bill Buckner was never the same player. And after he retired, had to move to Idaho to avoid the constant anger he faced in the Boston area. Really, fans probably should have blamed Calvin Chiraldi, Bob Stanley, or John McNamara. Either way, the Red Sox had now been in four World Series and lost all four in heartbreaking fashion over 68 years. If one picture is worth a thousand words, you have seen about a million words. Most fans now could not even remember the time when the Red Sox won four World Series. Over the next 18 years, the Red Sox competed. Pedro Martinez became the best pitcher in baseball, but the Sox couldn't make the World Series with him until it looked like they were on the cusp in 2003. We'll call this Fall 4.5. Up 5 0 in the bottom of the eighth of Game 7 against the dreaded Yankees, manager Grady Little kept Pedro in the game rather than going to the Red Sox' dominant bullpen. Pedro unraveled, letting the Yankees tie the game at 5. Then, in the 12th, Aaron Boone hit a home run to win it. The Sox went home without a title for their 85th straight season. Hey, you. Yeah, you. You've been watching this video for 14 minutes. Thanks. Subscribe. Do you feel tired yet? Do you feel like some of these stories are repetitive and they all kind of mix together? Well, that's how Red Sox fans felt. For three generations now, every single season that ended the same, without a title for the city of Boston. Entering 2004, there wasn't much reason for new hope. Throughout all 85 years, Red Sox fans hated the Yankees. The Sox were cursed, the Yankees always got lucky. In 1978, 2003, and constantly in the standings, the Yankees seemed to always come out on top. And in 2004, that appeared no different. 
The Yankees won Game 3 of the ALCS 19-8 and were on the verge of back-to-back AL pennants. No team had ever come back in baseball down 0-3 in a seven-game series. But over the next four games, the Red Sox performed a therapeutic exorcism that revitalized a loyal fan base generationally desperate for a title. The Sox won the AL pennant and then swept the Cardinals in the World Series, winning their first since 1918. The winning one isn't over. In 2007, 2013, and 2018, the Red Sox won titles. Curses aren't real, but even the non-devout can come to firmly believe in them. It's a natural human emotion to try to explain the unexplainable. How can a team come inches close four separate times? Why did Bill Buckner miss that ball? How did Enos Slaughter score all the way from first? How did it last 86 years? For whatever reason, the curse ended in 2004. For newer fans, the curse is merely a legend, not a lived experience. Babe Ruth never had any comment on the curse himself. The narrative built up over time, long after he died in 1948. Kari Stremski went into the Hall of Fame in 1989. His 1967 season is considered by many the greatest regular season of all time. Ted Williams went in in 1966 and got weird at the end of his life. His body is currently frozen in a lab in Arizona. In 2008, the Red Sox tried to bury the hatchet with a man who got far too much animosity from the curse and had him throw out the first pitch of opening day. Won't you please welcome him back to Boston and let him know that he is welcome always. Number six, Bill Buckner. Raucous applause for a man who the Boston fans had once lambasted proved that time truly healed all wounds. Bill Buckner died in 2019.